Our scripture reading this morning comes from James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18. I was just actually talking with Corinne and Adam about the infrequency with which we see readings from James in our lectionary cycle, and it's actually not the lectionary text for today, but it summoned me uh, this day as I was thinking about the harvest season and where we find ourselves. Um, So I hope that you'll open your hearts um, as you hear these words from the letter of James. Who is wise and understanding among you? Show your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is unearthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. May these words be to us our light and our life. Won't you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable unto you, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Family farmers first exposed me to the concept of faithfulness. Faithful to the land, these farmers were constant, immovable, unbreakable, and some of the most committed people I've had the privilege of knowing. Having grown up in rural Illinois, I knew farmers well. They were my neighbors, my friends, my community. I can still feel the cycle of the land bubble up within me as the seasons change. As winter slowly takes over the land, it's fitting for us to pause and consider what has been harvested in the season that has passed. The harvest always felt like it was a long time coming. From early spring through the earliest days of fall, Steady, silent growth would creep into the land. The corn and the beans, once but mere seedlings, would engulf the land in lush green, able to be seen for miles in the plains of Illinois. And the harvest, it seemed, came overnight. The farmers, they knew, they knew their crop well, and they were resolute about the decision that the harvest was upon us. Punctuated by the thunderous roll of combines and massive truck beds being filled, chutes filling silos, filling them to the brim for winter. I can still recall the sound of combines harvesting in the fields overnight. Rolling through the fields, seizing the harvest at the peak of perfection. When a storm was imminent, the farmers never wasted precious time to sleep. Natural forces were not something they could resist. Patiently, with steadfast commitment, they harvested, filling, loading, refueling, and unloading again and again. What had taken months to grow was erased from the rolling fields in just days. My childhood home was surrounded by farmland. I learned here the utmost respect and reverence for the land. The farmers yield to the land, never questioning nor speaking ill of it. They know the harvest would come in due time. The patience they exhibited was always steadfast, firm, resolute, and resolved. The farmers that I knew were wise as sages. 
but they held ancient knowledge of the land and the creatures that inhabited it. One of my most fond childhood memories was when my family brought home a calf to our hobby farm. It was the first cow we'd ever had. And our neighbor, the farmer's daughter, heard that we had a new calf. And she came over right away. And she taught me how to befriend this calf. With firmness and gentleness and humility, she taught me the secret of walking alongside this gentle, gentle, powerful giant. I learned that any anxiety I had was discern discernible immediately to the calf. I had to relearn what it meant to walk in relationship with nature so that I might walk alongside this co-created being who was the newest member of our family. I was taught that the natural world would, world could not and would not be manipulated for my own purposes or my own will. I had to bend to the larger will of creation. These were important lessons in my life. Farmers have passed on wisdom for ages. Much to my students' surprise, they composted long before it was trendy <laughs> because they knew it was good for the earth. They learned to rotate crops, not because it was more lucrative, but because it was good for generations to come, those yet to farm the land. And they spread the manure of animals because it nurtured healthy soil so that healthy crops would grow, so that they could feed the animals, and so that people could be nourished. The cycle of life was discernible to me, even at my very youngest of ages, living in the heartland of this country. But other things were discernible to me, too. I realized that I look like most of the people who surrounded me. I was white, and so were they. Textbooks became my primary encounter with race, culture, religion. Difference, really. In my town, cultural difference consisted of sorting through our German, English, and Irish heritages and the Catholic-Protestant split that divided Sunday morning brunch tables at the local diner. And today, my world is a much different place. I'm no longer awakened by the thunderous roll of combines, but kept up late, held in conversation with my amazing students just over the street at McAllister. They speak of home, and some of you with connections to Mac have had the privilege of hearing these stories. Their homes are places like Pakistan, the Ukraine, Mumbai, Georgia, New Hampshire, Portland, New York, my students reflect with me on the painful parts of their journey, perhaps friends who don't understand their passions, parents who have fallen out of love, self-realizations that change the orientation, the very fundamental orientation of their hearts. They speak also with me of joy and aspirations for a life, for work, and the ways that they desire to be a source of love in this world. And I've been around McAllister long enough to see some of them go out into the world and return. And they do such incredible things with gentleness of heart, with firmness of resolve, and hope for a better world. They volunteer, they go to medical school, they attend rabbinical school, they work for nonprofits, go to seminary, live in community, travel, protest, write poetry, they love generously. They build lives that are meaningful, complex, and beautiful. Through my relationships with my students, the fullness of the human family is much more accessible to me. And so I read from James' letter today, holding these two communities that orient me to wisdom, truth, and gentleness and questions of what is harvested in our lives, really. So I invite you to listen again, hearing these words from James. Who is wise and understanding among you? 
Show by your good life that your works are done with gentleness born of wisdom. But if you have any bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not be boastful and false to the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from above, but is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. For where there is envy and selfish ambition, there will also be disorder and wickedness of every kind. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits, without a trace of partiality or hypocrisy. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace for those who make peace. In this season of harvest celebrations, this week of Thanksgiving, it is fitting that we not only celebrate the harvest of the land, but also pause to consider what is planted within each one of us, what harvests we yield from our lives. Certainly been found, found myself asking that question of myself this past week and a half. I've been asking what comes of my life, what I have to give back to this world. And much to my surprise, I found that as much as my life felt full and at capacity, there was room for more fruits to be born. Fruits that were likely always within me, but called forth from the world's great pain. I've noticed within myself an inclination to be more kind, more generous, more outspoken, more resolute. I wonder if you've noticed these things in yourself. I wonder what you've noticed in your life, the way you've been reflecting about your ability and where you step into the world's pain. With the election season seemingly in our rearview mirror, and Thanksgiving just days away. This week in our office, we had the privilege of hosting New York Times religion contributor Samuel Friedman for a conversation this week. You may have seen his columns in the New York Times or his pieces in the New York Times. Um, he spoke with us and our students about the early impact of the election within religious communities. And he shared both some good, some okay, and some bad news with us. Some of the good news that he shared was that already new alliances were being formed between American Muslims and American Jews, standing against religious discrimination. And this is unprecedented, given the historic global conflicts between these two religious communities. It is a moment to remember, to be sure, some of the interesting news Sam lifted up for us was that Roman Catholics at the polls strayed from strict doctrinal values uh, voting, um, perhaps because they were recalling what it felt like to be marginalized minority in America in the 1920s. And the hard news was that American evangelicals showed up at the polls in larger numbers than they ever have before to vote for our president-elect. Sam said sparingly little about Protestants, other than that we had work to do. His brevity of words spoke volumes about the privilege and place that we as Protestants have in this society. Sam also spoke in personal terms about his news reporting. One of our, my wise students asked him about his own biases and how they found his, their way into his columns. Sam said, quite wisely, at the end of the day that he wanted to be on the right side of history about several things. Two of those things that he lifted up were marriage equality and normal, normalizing the American Muslim experience. His own writing, if you've seen it, complicates the narrative about how re religion functions and where it exists in this country. In a recent piece, May of 2016, he reported about the first Muslim community in America, located in North Dakota. It's 
been there for some 120 years. These are the stories he believes need to be told. These are the American stories that lift up who we are and who we have been as a nation and who we ought to be. He spoke of living out his own Jewish values by doing what he knows is right, sharing the stories that need to be told by bringing balance to public perceptions. What Sam oriented his hearers to was the responsibility that we must all take for the recent turn of national events. We can't point to one faith community or one place on the map and say, there, if only they had voted this way or that or showed up. The divide that has been unearthed speaks volumes about the pain, feelings, and beliefs that have long been dormant in this country. And so it seems fitting for us to puzzle today over James. It's a complicated book with a complicated history, but we're living in complicated times and complicating history ourselves, so perhaps it's an appropriate reading for today. James was infamously known to be one of the least favorite letters of Martin Luther. The pastors in the audience will likely know that he called it an epistle of straw, <laughs> giving it little credence and saying rarely a kind word about it. The book of James, or James' letter, inclusion in the Bible, was long debated over several centuries, and it was finally canonized in the fourth century. On a whole, it's a really unique text. Unlike any other book in the Bible, it offers guidance on daily practices for Christian life in a way that's actually quite prescriptive and is absent of lofty theological ideology. Little mention is made of Jesus in the book of James. I think his name is uttered only twice. And yet we see nearly the entirety of the Sermon on the Mount captured in this quick five chapters in the book of James. And as you'll recall, the Sermon on the Mount is some of Jesus' more significant moral teachings. Based on the writing style of the, the book of James, we suspect that James was writing to a marginalized community, the poor, the oppressed, the dispossessed of the first century. The scholarship of feminist theologian Elsa Tamez lifts up, the, lifts up in her book, The Scandalous Message of James. It lifts up that one of the reoccurring themes and predominant themes for the book of James is the theme of patience. Patience. It's a word that not very many people are eager to hear these days. But return, if you will, with me to the farmers that I began with today. What I didn't say about those farmers is that sometimes they were handed absolute junk. A failed harvest, livestock that fell ill, droughts for which there was no remedy. And no farmer that I ever knew willingly or eagerly walked away from their relationship with the land. Their actions evoked a knowledge that this relationship between the people and the land began before they arrived on this earth and would extend long beyond when they left this earth. There was a wisdom in that knowledge that helped them stay the course with patience. Not the type of patience that evokes submission or resignation, but patience that was resolute, enduring, and renewed. And this is the patience to which James calls his readers again and again. And in this brief reading for today, he invites us to consider how we orient our hearts in light of that patience. My partner will tell you that I anticipated the outcome of the election. What I could not anticipate, however, was the emotional upheaval felt in my McAllister community and family. For the past week and a half, 
the pain has been effusive. Every direction I turn an identity, the very personhood of one of my students, colleagues, or friends has been challenged, offended, dismissed, violated, desecrated by the rhetoric of politicians and citizens alike. Our dare to dream students who have undocumented families are terrified. My beloved Muslim community immediately felt the impact of the election with citizens emboldened to be direct, blunt, and unashamed of their discriminatory language, actions, and belief. International students have good reason to question their welcome in this country and are revisiting their plans to travel in and out of the United States in the months ahead. And still others worry about what might happen to their rights the right to marry, the right to make decisions about reproductive health, the rights of African Americans and persons of color in this country, and still seemingly mon more mundane questions like global warming and environmental politics and the Paris Agreement seem indelicate in light of the way that people's personhood feels assaulted. And yet these questions are so important to our human family. And I won't even begin to unpack how my former call, my last place of ministry, Wellesley College, a women's college where a candidate for the presidency is an alumnus, and was dealing with all of this. Immediately, Wellesley was visited by hate crimes, violent rhetoric, and the unleashing of reprehensible moral behavior. In the last week and a half, too many of the people I love and care for and call my chosen family, have been hurt and are hurting in unspeakable ways. But we must speak, and we must find our voice. And we must resist the temptation to over-intellectualize our faith and say that simply faith alone is enough in moments like these. We must resist the temptation to cloak ourselves in theological conundrums that invites us to spiral inward to the places where we feel safe and secure and sure. No, James urges us to actualize hope through our action, bearing a harvest that is worthy of God's creation. What's before each and every one of us is a hard look at how we orient, at what is in our hearts rather, and how we orient ourselves in this world. James urges us to peer into our hearts, to see what is sown in them. Is it peace? Is it kindness? Is it gentleness? How do we, when we find something other than those things, adjust, change, reorient ourselves so that we can live in harmony and peace with this co-created world? These are the big questions that are before us. These are the questions that James invites seems that they're fitting questions for this harvest season as we consider what we plant in our lives and what we hope to be harvested. Amen.